Let's have a little talk with Jesus. So as, uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with us to Genesis, the first chapter. And, uh, and no, I'm not going to preach the entire Bible. I'm just going to preach a little portion of it. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about doing some other stuff as far as the 4th of July and things like that. And, you know, normally for the big holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and things like that, I'll do something topical about, you know, the holiday or whatever, something that maybe touches home that we can share with our friends and things like that. But, you know, and everything that's going on, all the chaos, all the craziness, everything that's gone on the last six months with this pandemic, with all this social unrest and everything else, it's real easy for us as Christians to get caught up in that emotionally. We get caught up in that, you know, and if we're not careful, we'll allow all this stuff that's making us upset and uh, disappointed and confused and anxious, and we'll let those emotions pour over to the point where we are no longer effective lights for Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, I'm going to try and weave uh, three passages of Scripture together. Just bear with me today, and uh, I'll try to deliver to you the way the Lord gave it to me. Uh, but, you know, Genesis, the first chapter, 14th verse. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the, night from the, the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you once again for the privilege of being in the house of God. We thank you for your holy anointed word. And Lord, we ask that you anoint us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet to say the words you would have us to say, to speak the words that would reach out and that they would touch hearts, that lives would be changed because of the anointing, because of your spirit. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ's precious holy name we pray. Amen. So what kind of light are you? Here in Genesis it said, And God made two great lights, and the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. And the last thing there is said, imagine, it says, and he made the stars also. Think about that. God is looking at the universe, and it's not complete. He's looking at everything that he's starting to make, and it's not complete. So he says, I'm going to make a sun to rule the day. I'm going to make a moon to rule the night, and I'm going to make some stars also. So just imagine as he's looking across the expanse of the universe, and he's looking across all this, and he says, I need to make a couple of lights. I need to make one for the day, one for the night. I need to make some stars too. But think about it. If God had made the sun and the moon with the same kind of choices that we have, with the choice to obey or not, just think about what this world would be like. See, if the sun had the choice, it might wake up one morning and go, I don't feel like, I don't feel like shining today. I don't feel like doing what you know, I was made to do. And think about it, without the life-giving rays of the sun, without the warmth of the sun, without everything that the sun does for us, the next thing you know, this world would be full of darkness. This world would be dreary. And eventually, life on this earth would cease as we know it because there wouldn't be the energy. There wouldn't be the strength. There wouldn't be everything that we need for life to happen in this earth. Imagine if the moon had a choice to shine or not. You know, just imagine that. The moon said, oh, I don't want to shine either. The moon may not be as impressive as the sun. It's not as bright as the sun. But think about last night as we looked at the full moon. Think about the harvest moon. Think about the blue moon. Think about all the things, all the inspirations about the song that the moon is given. But think about the gravitational pull that the moon has on the earth. How it affects the tides. How it affects the ocean. How it affects the plant life. See, without the moon, the world wouldn't be the way it's supposed to be anyway. We need to understand that the moon serves a purpose that it was made to do. See, we need to understand that the moon was absolutely essential for the maintenance of life on this planet as well. God knew what he was doing when he made the sun. God knew what he was doing when he made the, made the moon. Amen. And it says those last five little words in that 16th verse says, He made the stars also. 
Well, I don't know what the stars do to affect us, but I know when I go out there at night on a clear night and I'm out in the country and I can see those stars lighting up across the sky, I realize that this is a tiny little planet and that God cares about you and I. And we look out across that expansive sky and we see the lights all over the place and we see everything. We realize that God spoke all that into existence. The same God that spoke the sun to hang there, the same God that spoke the moon to hang there, the same God God that did all that cared enough about me to send his only begotten son that he could shed his blood so that I could have life and have life eternal. Think about that as you look at the stars, how small and insignificant we might be, but think the same God that put them there. The same God that put them there knows the numbers of the hair of my head, knows the numbers of everything. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what I want to do. That same God that did all that Loved you and I enough to send his only begotten son. In the fifth chapter of Matthew, that same son, Jesus Christ, spoke these words in the 14th verse. It said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. See, as Jesus stood there, he was speaking to average people, and he was telling them, let your light shine. I've created a light in you. Once you became a child of mine, once you became a follower of mine, there is a light within you that you need to walk around and that you need to show to everybody. Don't hide it under a bushel. You're like a city set on a hill. You're like that light that people can see throughout the house. Don't hide that light. Don't put it under a bushel. Realize that people are going to see that light, and they're going to watch your life and they're going to see your good works and because of your good works they're going to realize that you serve a heavenly father they're going to see your good works and they're going to glorify your father which is in heaven don't let your light be hidden so we get all the way to the 25th chapter of Matthew 14 through the 30th verse and like I said I don't know if the Lord meant us to weave these three verse uh, these three passages together but I'm going to do it And it's a very familiar passage, a very familiar parable. We all know it. It's a parable of the talents. You know, and the parable talks about a master that's getting ready to leave on a journey. And he calls in three of his servants. He gives one of them five talents. He gives one of them two talents. He gives one of them one talent. And he goes out and he says, he says, you know, occupy till I return. And Jesus also said that the master gave this according to their ability according to what they could do. He didn't just pick that. So he goes away, and then he returns, and he asks for an accounting. And we all know the story. He comes back, and he talks to the the man who he'd given five talents to. The servant said, look, Lord, I've taken your five talents, and I've used your five talents, and I've gained five more talents. And in that 21st verse of that 25th chapter, he says, his Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Oh, what glorious words. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. So enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So that was exciting. So we come to the two-talent person, and he comes back and he says the same thing. Lord, I've taken the two talents that you gave me, and I've worked them, and I've used them, and I've gained two more talents. And he's told him the same thing. They were both greatly praised. He didn't set the five-talent person higher than the two-talent person. He goes, listen, you've used just what I've given you to use. You've used it exactly the way I wanted to, you to use it. You've used it exactly the way I wanted you to use it. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. He told him the same exact things he told the five-talent person. But here, here's where it gets sticky, the one-talent person. In the 24th verse, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strode. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. There the... Thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. 
Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, we need to understand there's, you know, I don't know if God intended these to be together, but think about that. Whether you're a sun, whether you're a moon, whether you're a star, whether you're a candlestick, whether you're a light, whether you're a five-talent, a two-talent, a one-talent person, we are to be exactly what God made us to be. We're to do the work that God made us to be. Where would we be without the sun doing what it's supposed to do? Where would we be without the moon doing what it's supposed to do? Where would we be if we're not the light that God has called us to be? Where would we be? We need to understand as we look at this parable of the talents, start looking at them closely. Look at the five-talent person. See, what are the five-talent people? They're achievers. They're the ones that are the go-getters. They're the ones that are out there to get things done. They're always out there leading and deciding and doing all that stuff. As you look at Scripture, you think about Abraham, and you think about Moses, and you think about Elijah, you think about David, you think about Paul and John and Peter. You think about all those. But the only ones that really leap out at you is maybe being a five-talent person before God got a hold of them might have been David. Might have been Paul because of the way he was educated. But the rest of them, they were used of God. They, God made Abraham a leader. God made Moses a deliverer. God took an old fisherman named Peter that was rebellious, that was a little emotional, and he turned him in to the rock that he built his church on. He turned him into the one that came down from that upper room on the day of Pentecost and said, this is not that that was, this is not, they're not drunk like you suppose, but this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I pour out my spirit upon all earth. See, he took him and did all that. See, why, why did he make them five-talent people? Because they were willing to let the Lord direct their life. They were willing to be obedient to what God had called them do, to do. They were willing, and we see that that's the result. We start gaining more and more talents as we're obedient to let the Lord lead us and guide us. See, five-talent people today have a problem. And the biggest problem is they're usually in great demand because the old saying's true. You want something done right, Find a busy person to do it. See, if we're not careful, we try to load everything on somebody else. We try to load all that stuff on. And the next thing you know, five talent people find out that maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I don't want to do all this work. See, the next thing you know, we see five talent people in business. And they're doing all kinds of things. They're making money for the company. They're making money for themselves. They're doing all that stuff. But when they get to church, are they still a five talent person? They might not be because church isn't a priority in their life. See, what's more important? What's more important? Is this life down here more important? Or is it the eternity that's stretching out in front of you? Is it the eternity that's out there waiting for you? We need to be doing everything for the Lord that we can do. See, God, God wants us to use the gifts that he's given us, the talents that he's given us, the abilities that he's given us. Just think about that. If the five-talent person had just used three of the talents... If he had just used three of the talents, he would have still done more than the other two servants. But would that have been good enough? Would that have been good enough? Because we need to understand, what did he say later? To whom much is given, much is expected in return. See, God gave him all five of those talents and expected him to use all of those talents. Then we get to the two-talent people. Now, we all can breathe a little bit easier because we're a little bit more comfortable. We're down closer to our level. You know, in the Bible, maybe Andrew was a two-talent person. Maybe Andrew would be an example of that. He always seemed to be playing second fiddle to Peter because every time you heard, you know, every time you heard Andrew's name mentioned, it was always as the son of Simon. The, I mean, the brother of Simon, the brother of Peter. He was always mentioned in conjunction with that. See, we need to understand that's the way it is. Second, two-talent people are always second nature. They don't always get the spotlights. But think about that. If everybody was a soloist and there was no, there was no two talent people behind them to sing harmony. Oh, just think about, think about how much a choir sounds, how good a choir sounds when all those, 
All those voices come together. All those harmonies come together. How full it sounds and how great it sounds. See, two talent people make five talent people look good. The church is built with two talent people. We need to understand. We need to do exactly what God has called us to do. We need to be about the Father's business. We need to be doing all that stuff. You know, when you take your two talents, the beautiful part about it is when you take those two talents and give them to God, God will use them. God will multiply them. God will turn them back to you. And the next thing you know, you may have four talents. You may have six talents. You may have eight talents because you're using the things that God has given you to use. We need to make sure that we're doing this thing. God gives each and every one of us talents and abilities that we're supposed to be using for the kingdom of God. See, people ask me all the time, well, what's the difference between a talent and a spiritual gift? Some define talents as the natural ability that, you know, God gives you when you're born. Like, you know, anybody that's heard a song by Elvis Presley, those are natural abilities that God had given somebody when they're born. And they define spiritual gifts as, you know, something that God gives you when you come to the Lord, when you seek his face. And we need to understand that. But the difference, I don't think, is that big. I really believe that the gifts and the talents that he's given us, when we bring them to the altar, when we bring them back to him, and we give them to the Lord and say, Lord, use these talents, whatever they may be, whether it's music, whether it's singing, whether it's speaking, whether it's to teach, whether it's just to reach out. There's a lot of people out there that just instantly know how somebody feels, that empathic spirit, and they could feel, some, they could feel that. But when they give that back to the Lord, and the Lord takes that back and turns it into discernment or turns it into something else, see these abilities that he's given us. When we give them to him, he turns them into something greater. He turns them into something that's going to edify the body of Christ. He turns them into something that's going to be like a light standing on a candlestick. He turns them into something that when people look at us, they will see our good works and they will glorify the, our Father which is in heaven. We need to understand that. Sometimes our two talents don't accomplish everything that we would like them to do. But they accomplish exactly what God would like them to do as long as we give them to him. See, a lot of times we long to be one of those people in the spot. Spotlight. We long to be one of those people that are getting a pat on the back, but it's not about that because one of these days I'm hoping to cross into that pearly gate and he's going to give me a crown of righteousness. He's going to be the one that gives me my reward. I don't need the pat on the back down here. I don't need all those accolades down here. I just need, the, need Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all I want him to say. That's all I want him to say. See, we need to be willing to give our talent back to God. And let God bless it and multiply it over and over again, whatever it is. We need to put those talents to use for God. What kind of light are you being today? One talent people. There are people out there that look at this scripture and they look at the one talent as something bad. But he was given the same opportunity. He may not have been given the same talents, but he was given the same opportunity as the other to go and put it to use. And there's people who say, Brother Houston, what if I'm a one-talent person? Well, think about the times in the Bible where it talked about the one-talent people. Think about the little widow woman that just had one mite, and she put it in the offering. And Jesus said, hey, I want you all to see this. She gave everything that she had. You guys may have been given all kinds of money, but she gave all that she had. She gave more than you all. Why? Because she stood on faith believing. God had given her this, I'm giving it back to God. Think about the leper of the ten lepers. Jesus healed the ten lepers, and only one of them turned around to say thank you. He said, where are the other nine? See, we need to understand God has called us, whether we're a five talent, a two talent, one talent, just to do the work that he's called us to do. In the ninth chapter of John, the 25th verse, it talks about the blind man who received his sight. And he was called in front of the Sanhedrin court to give an explanation of what happened. And he couldn't explain how Jesus healed him. But listen to what he said in that 25th verse. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that, whereas I was blind and now I see. See, that's the one thing he knew, that he was blind and now he could see. That's all we need to understand. If we can only do one thing, I don't know, if, I don't know what Jesus is. But I know what he did for me. 
See, that's what the world wants to hear. They don't want you, they don't want to hear you quote Genesis to Revelation. They don't want to hear you quote scripture after scripture. They want you to tell them, what did Jesus do for you? You don't have to tell me about anything else. Just tell me what Jesus did for you. As we start telling people what Jesus did for us, they'll start watching our life. They'll start taking notice of us. They'll start watching how we walk. They'll start watching how we talk. And it says, they will see your good works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. What kind of light are you? See, I don't necessarily like the end of the story of that 25th chapter of Matthew. And that 20, 29th verse. It says, For to everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of feet, teeth. See, think about that. He took away his talent and gave it to the one with ten. And he cast him out into outer darkness. He cast him out into outer darkness. See, to who everyone is given something, they're going to be given more. If you're doing a work for God, he's going to give you more. If you're being faithful with what he's given you, he's going to give you more. If you continue to do the work that he's called you to do, he's going to give you more. He's going to bless you and bless you. And with every one of those talents comes responsibility. But with every one of those responsibilities, if you fulfill them, there'll be rewards. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. Enter into that. See, we need to understand, you know, I've never looked at the stars under a big high-powered microscope. I've never been under, the, you know, out there looking out in the telescope, but I've got friends that's got those big telescopes, and they sit there, and they look up at the sky, and they tell me about, oh, this star and that star and this planet and all that stuff. But the one thing they all say is the stars look so different in the telescope. They don't look like little twinkling lights. They look brilliant, and you'll see different colors and different things and different shape and the brilliance that you see through a telescope that you can't see with the naked eye. And they all talk about that. See, when God looks at our faces, he sees potential beyond what we could ever possibly imagine because God can see us better than we can see ourselves. God's looking at us just like we look at stars through a telescope. He's looking at us, and he knows what we're capable of. He knows what we're able to do. He knows that all the things that we're able to do. We just have to be convinced that he is enough. See, a lot of times we look at it like we've got to step out, like we've got to be enough. But I'm telling you here, if you step out on faith to do what God has called you to do, he is enough. He will equip those that he's called. You know, he doesn't call the people with ability. He calls people with availability. He wants to make sure that you're doing the things that he's called you to do. He wants us to be obedient. Just like the son when he said, hang up there. You make sure that there's days. You make sure that there's seasons. You make sure that there's years. And how do we know? How do we know that fall is coming? There's less and less light during the day. There's less and less light during the day. It might even start getting a little cooler. But I saw something a little depressing uh, today. The last time we had seven days of 90 degree weather was October of last year. So that tells me I've got four months of hot. I don't like hot. Some of you might like hot. I don't like hot. See, God looks at our faces and sees potential. He wants us to be happy serving him. He wants us to be happy doing the things that he's called us to do. See, a lot of times we think that we have to be more than enough. But God is who's more than enough. What kind of light are you today? I've told this story before. It's about Telemachus. He's a little Christian monk from the 4th century. Um, it, was the late, it was like 391 A.D. As my wife comes to the piano. He, he worked in this little bitty tiny town about, about 100, 150 miles outside of Rome. And one day he was, he, was working, he was working in his garden, and he was a Christian monk. And he heard God speaking to him, telling him to go to Rome. He'd never been to a big city, much less a city the size of Rome. So he dropped his tools in the garden and started walking and walking. And it took him two weeks to get to Rome. And he was weary. He was road weary. He was tired. He was a little bitty guy. And as he got into Rome, he saw these people hustling down the street and running to the Colosseum. And he said, where are you guys going? We're going to see the gladiators. 
And so he got kind of pushed along because he was small. He wasn't bigger, he wasn't much bigger than a large child. And he got pushed along and pushed along, and he finally found himself in the Colosseum. And he stood there as these gladiators faced Caesar, and they said, We who are about to die salute you. And he realized that these men were about to fight to death. So he started trying to make his way through the crowd to get down there, and he's screaming, In the name of Christ, stop this. And these men started fighting and swinging their swords, and they were stabbing one another and hitting one another with these heavy instruments. And he climbed down over the side, and the people were laughing at this little bitty guy trying to stop this fight. And pretty soon they got mad because he was interrupting their entertainment. And he kept screaming, For the, in the name of Christ, stop this! In the name of Christ! And one gladiator finally had enough and hit him with a sword. And it dropped him in the sand. And his last word was, in the name of Christ, stop this. And he died. And all that laughing, all that cheering in that Colosseum became deathly quiet. And pretty soon one man got up and walked out and followed by another person and another person. In about 15 minutes, the Colosseum emptied. And as those gladiators stood there in that blood-soaked sand, they dropped their weapons and they walked out of that Colosseum in 391 A.D. And there was never again from that day forward, another battle to the death in that Colosseum. All because of one tiny little Christian man that said, in the name of Christ, stop this. See, we don't know what kind of effect we'll have on the world until we stand up for the cause of Christ. We don't know. There's a lot of chaos going on out, of the, out there. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of angst. There's a lot of anxiousness going on out there. And we don't know what's going to happen. But in the name of Christ, if we go forward in the name of Christ, what kind of light are you today? You don't have to be a five-talent person. You don't have to be the sun. You could be the moon. Or you could be the stars. What kind of light are you? Are you hiding it under a bushel? Or are you going to stick it on a candlestick for your friends? for your family, for your co-workers, for your neighbors to see. And they can see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If you're not living up to your Christian potential, if you're not using the talents, the abilities, the gifts, the opportunities that God has given you, we can start today. Let's all stand. Let's come around the altar, have a good season of prayer. Oh